Hi, I'm John Barry, author of Pattern Recognition, host, hosted by tappedout.net. On with regards to the question of the banning of Paradox Engine. It was a good call, really, honestly, good call, uh, for several reasons. But the most important reason to me is that it represented a fundamental break in the way resources are handled in the Commander. At a four-player table, the ability to act and react must be more measured than with a two-player game. And as such, a card that effectively makes all your cards lose an opportunity and resource costs is a bad one. To wit, Paradox Engine's sole drawback that of not untapping land is completely irrelevant if the triggering spell is cast without lands in the first place. Uh, such with the plethora of rocks in the game, or even on the green side, mana dorks. This leads, and I have seen this myself in the local commander scene, to cases where Paradox Engine simply existing means that the game is over in favor of that player, as they can simply do what they want, when they want, and nothing can stop them because they have infinite renewable resources, whereas everybody else is still limited. The engine needed to go, and go it went. Hi, my name is John Barry. I am the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net. I'm addressing the question regarding the banning of Iona, Shield of Ameria. For Iona, her banning was part of a two-step process involving Painter's Servant and Interaction that I believe our host will have already covered. Uh, addressing her ability to simply block out a single color from the game for as long as she exists is the pinnacles of oppressive control. She can effectively target a single player and tell them, no, you're not playing the game anymore, and forcing that player to sit at the table twiddling their thumbs because a third or a half or even the whole of their deck is now literally unplayable. Uh, that is one of the definitions of unfun. And at its heart, Commander is supposed to be a fun and social format. Iona kills that, with a knife to the back. In addition, the only real counterplay for decks is to run colorless removal. And honestly, I'm not seeing cards like Universal Solvent or All is Dust in deck lists that often, save for fringe cases where dust is used under an Eldrazi Commander uh, as their board wipe of choice. Forcing dedicated counterplay to a card such as Iona is format warping, and thus something had to go, and removing Yona and unbanning Painter Servant is probably the best choice. <clears throat> Hi, my name is John Barry. I am the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. I am addressing the question of the banning of Flash. The Flash ban is an example of one of the issues that comes from having a game as old as Magic in a format that allows for old cards to be played. Flash, if used as intended, allows you to make a creature cheaper as well as allowing you to play at an instant speed at the cost of playing a card and one in the blue. This isn't a bad thing, and I think it can work so long as the cards in question are more in line with, say, Scout's Warning from Future Sight. Pay a cost, cast a card, cast your next card with Flash. But the real issue with Flash was the sacrifice effect. When combined with Protean Hulk, it kind of broke any sort of balance that may have come from simply granting Flash the mechanic to a creature. One of the fundamental conceits behind Commander, the singleton format, is made a joke when people can simply fetch a card again and again using any of a variety of cards to do so. That Hulk is so open-ended in its fetching and recursion just makes more games that run the same way whenever the Hulk dies, and it goes for the same enabling cards. Flash and Hulk are a problem together, and separate, well, there's no real good answer to it. Hulk has other sack outlets to go off on the board, and Flash will always find other creatures to enter, then sack on the cheap. The choice to ban Flash is the result of trying to remove a single instant speed enabler over the lethal follow-up, and only time will tell if this is the better choice. Players, decide. Scroll down. <clears throat> Hi. My name is John Barry, author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the banning of Lutri the Spell Chaser, BANNED! And for good reason. Lutri represents a known development bias over Wizards in that they design their cards for draft and standard, first, second, third, and fourth, with other formats coming in, well, fifth, except for Commander this year. This is reasonable. There's only so many man hours you can put into testing cards, and it would not surprise me at all that there is more play done with cards in the week leading up to pre-release by the general public checking out the previews than it is done in the whole design and development stage. The difference in scale in terms of people with different viewpoints and buys is colossal. Lutri works in formats that it was designed for, draft and standard. 
being preemptively axed in commander was the right call. The RC did a good job here. And I will stand by that decision for it to be the fastest banning in Magic history at minus 48 days. There is absolutely no reason to draw any sort of aggro or ire from the commander player base as they would have realized what the RC already knew. Lutri was all upside and no downside. As a card that could have gone into a format with the companion limitation, wasn't a limitation but a rule, then adding it to the copy effect on the outside of the game meant it is that players received a massive boost at no cost, save the three mana. But that being said, the recent change to the companion rule from Wizards means that Lutri should be reevaluated. Yes, it's still a dual caster mage that has the advantage of being paid for with blue instead of just red, but now it goes into the hand at sorcery speed, which means it's now a known and more interactive quantity, something less broken than a copy effect from nowhere. Let's give Lutri a chance with the new rules and see if the banning needs to be upheld. Is it the problem with the card or the mechanic? Players, decide. <clears throat> Hello, my name is John Barry. I am the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by TappedOut.net, the online deck building community. The unbanning of Painter's Servant and the concurrent banning of Iona represent two halves to a whole, a single combo that allowed a white player to simply tell everyone else on the board to stop playing the game. As it was Yona that sealed the deal, while Painter Servant simply was the setup, the reversal of bannings is something I can get behind. Painter Servant is, at its heart, a card designed to help out white, most of all. Uh, perhaps it's old, my old foginess showing, uh, but white is the color that cares about color itself the most. Everything from the classic Circles of Protection to Yona, Shield of Ameria, to God's Willing, a card reprinted in Core 2020 so we know that color is still relevant to white. White cares about color. And because of this, this ability to set all colors to one, even if it doesn't really change the function of the game, uh, allows, allows the white the opportunity to focus their defenses. Now, I've won a deck centered around eight and a half tails and her ability to protect from anything. But let me tell you, having a passive effect that means I can save one mana for each activation is something that adds up over time. I only need to run a single circle or rather than five, and it frees up space for cards used to win the game rather than draw it out. The unbanning of Servant should help White in the long run. It's not a big thing, but it is a subtle thing. Uh, and taking out Yon at the same time? Good, because you're preventing the lockout combo. Remember, guys, unbanning Painter Servant should help to make the game more fun in its own way. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by TappedOut.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the question of how I would judge the performance of the Rules Committee over the past year and whether or not they are leading the format in the right direction, to which I have to say, thank you, Rules Committee. You have volunteered to do a thankless and stressful job, one that has seen its shares of up and down. I'm sure that in a perfect world, you could all say, all is well. Nothing must be done, for the game is perfectly balanced and all may have fun. But every time new cards come out, you have to worry, is this the card that breaks the format? Is this the new Flash? Is this the new Leovold Emissary of Trest? Is this the new Lutri that we have to preemptively ban because it's just that broken? That is a job you have chosen to take upon yourselves as a service to the community and to the format. You worry so that we don't have to. You suffer so that the rest of us can enjoy the game. So you've done a good job. I approve of your work. I love you all for it. And thank you all. Hello, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by TappedOut.net, the online deck building community. The Commander Advisory Group uh, has been around for just over a year. How would I judge the performance? And what would an ideal CAG do? I think you're doing a good job, guys. I love you all. Uh, you're doing it as an extension of the Rules Committee. You've taken on many of the same responsibilities as them. And by helping to share in the research and review load, you're making it easier and smoother to come to conclusions designed to help the commander as a format and as a game. But remember, your job is to provide opinions and advice. So if I have one request of you, something I'd like to see from you all in an ideal world, it would be to embody the idea of a loyal opposition. That is, be the people who love the game as much as everyone else, who want to see it succeed as much as everyone else. But don't be a yes man. Don't be that person who agrees with a thing because everyone else says so. Choose to object. Plant your feet and dissent. 
forced discussion and reason to be the hallmarks of your existence and not to be a rubber stamp on the rules committee or to be a voice for the latest fad. Think, stand your ground, even if you know you're wrong, so that the resulting decisions are stronger for it. Do a good job, please. Hello, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by TappedOut.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the question of how would I judge Wizards of the Coast's performance in relation to the handbook commander format, embracing commander, and to a lesser extent, brawl, is a good move by Wizard. Make no mistake about that. Encouraging the format helps raise both players and the company up, but Wizards must also be careful of overreach. Playtesting new cards and standard sets for commander is a massive commitment and even the slightest misstep can have devastating consequences, such as with the, well, blue tree. But you're doing good. Commander precons are an excellent way to introduce players to the format, and while I appreciate the experiment of tying these, this year's decks to Ikoria and its mechanics, I'm not sure it's something you should try to keep doing. On the other hand, if you're to try to do the same thing for Brawl decks, that's a choice I can get behind, as it will help bridge the player side development between Standard, Brawl, and Commander. But the real overreach I'm worried about? Commander Legends. Draft and Commander have so little overlap that trying to meld the two into a viable format is something I have tried to wrap my head around again and again to no avail. On paper, I think this is a misstep. Yes, I know, Draft sells packs, and packs mean boxes, which means an improvement to your bottom line. But forcing every set you put out to be Draft viable takes away from other formats, like, say, everything constructed. I look forward to the set. You had me sold on the Baron's back, baby! But I'm not going to draft it. I just can't get behind it. Hi, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the question of which legendary creature printed in the past year do you think was the best designed out of the out of the pre-cons? Well, best cards. I really want to say the partners of Braylon and Shabraz, because who doesn't want a flying shark? No, seriously, who doesn't? Nobody? Okay, we're good. Uh, but honestly, in the end, I'm going to have to stick with Elsha of the Infinite. This Jeskai commander from last year does what I think is best for new and old players of the format, and that is very simple. Elsha being a creature that has prowess, which is plus one plus whenever he casts an on-creature spell, Let's you look at the top card of your library at any time and let you cast the top card of your library if it's not a creature. Uh, it's a good thing because Elsha doesn't tell you how to play your deck or the game. Elsha doesn't pigeonhole you into the one true path of, your, of the commander. Rather, Elsha is a global enabler. Uh, she makes what your deck does better. Does she have a drawback? Yes, of course she does. She encourages certain styles of play, but she does so in a way that doesn't force you down a very specific, narrow path. Elsha's good. I like her. I'm going to be playing with her more. Hello, my name is John Barry. I am the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net. Uh, with regards to the question of which do I think is the most problematic legendary creature in the past two uh, for Commander Precon sets, 1919 and Ikoria 2020, I'm concerned about Gabby Nest Warden most of all. Now, mostly because I've been focusing on the cycling deck because I've been turning into a Jeskai Commander for some strange reason. Uh, Gabby Nest Warden is a card whose entire gimmick boils down to cycle on your turn or you're doing it wrong. Yes, her ability to say that the first card you cycle each turn costs zero instead of whatever the actual cycling cost, yes, works on each turn. Uh, but it's the cycle on your turn and get the extra dino, dino cat? Yeah. Uh, it's not the neighbor. It's, it, it, yes, it has a lot of fun synergy with Eldraine and the whole draw the second card each turn. And there's a whole bunch of those, don't get me wrong. It's just that it's a limiter. Gabby is telling you how to play your deck. It is pointing you at a very narrow 
means of playing the game that it doesn't open up, it limits. It's the wrong kind of limitation. At least the dino cat she makes are cute. That's good art. Hello, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the question about color, uh, to wit, uh, the idea that white has been consistently falling behind with each and every new set, and green seems to be getting the most powerful cards in each set. Do I agree? Disagree? What do I think about it? Balance is not a linear thing, but rather it is cyclical. Do I think that green is on the upswing? Yes, sure. Do I think it's displaced blue as the most powerful and best commander color? No, of course not. Blue is still blue. Let's be honest with ourselves here. You have to recall that a lot of things that are powerful in all colors we are, are cards that we simply take for granted. It's the new cards that draw attention. And because green is getting a bunch of new toys, there is, I think, a faulty bias in thinking that the color is being deliberately ratcheted up in comparison to white. But on the flip side, white itself. There's not enough time to break down the issues, but white has been getting more toys. They're just not splashy killers. Their approach of the second sun, their dawn of hope. They're cards that play to white's strengths, patience and the slow game. That, and whenever white so much as sneezes, the whole board goes boom and everyone is back to square one. Seriously, every new set, they get a board wipe of some stripe, and careful use of these can lead to a white deck gaining an advantage over everyone else. You just have to be smart about it, and don't expect everyone to get the same splashy effects all the time. To those who want more toys in white, who want them to be more like everybody else, I have two questions for you. What do you want from white? To, what do you want from white? What do you want it to do that doesn't muddle the color pie anymore? And second, are you going to be patient? Because no solution comes easy or quick. I think that one's too long. Let me have to redo that one. Hi, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the question of companion, as a mechanic, it has caused problems in other formats from legacy to standard. And how do I feel about it? Companion is something I see as trying to bring the idea of, of the commander into constructed formats in a way that Brawl can't or doesn't. But in terms of commander itself, Aside from the justifiable pre-banning of Lutri before the rules change, I think that Commander as a format is already resilient enough to survive the Companions. They offer utility for the most part, that's true, and there really is nothing in it that isn't already in the format. Companions are redundant in their own way. For example, Zitra is Training Grounds, Umori is a Cloud Keep, uh, Lutri is Dual Caster Mage. This mechanic means you're just getting this effect more viable and readily. I don't see them coming to dominate the format, especially after the rules change. I do see commanders taking time to try and figure out what works and doesn't, and decide for themselves if it's worth it or not. I, for one, am looking forward to trying out a deck starring Karavek the Merciless with Ovash as my companion. I know, obvious. But I'm willing to give the mechanic a chance in this format. It's something Wizards wanted to try, and trying is an inherently good idea. Just because the execution fell flat doesn't mean that there aren't pieces we can't pick up and use. <clears throat> Hello, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the persistent question of hybrid mana and color identity in Commander, well, I don't get the problem with hybrid mana. Well, okay, I do but it's on an intellectual level, not a deck building level. I get that cards that are hybrid are supposed to exist in the narrow junction between two pieces of a color pie, being a logical either or statement when applied to colors. That is, it is a card that could exist in one color or the other, but because the colors match, the ability matches between the two of them and the casting cost is hybrid, it somehow should only mean that one should apply rather than both. No. I think hybrid mana needs to stay as a case of the card counting as all relevant colors. Not because of the casting cost itself, 
but how would you deal with activated abilities that include hybrid mana, such as with Shu Yun the Silent Tempest, or with cards that have a certain color in them than something else that's hybrid, like, oh, say, Font Shoreblade? Is it white blue? Is it white green? No. Hybrid mana has to stay at all colors, lest you wind up with confusion about what is or is not in the deck, what can or cannot go into it, either as the commander or in the 99. Hey, the com companions are hybrid too, so there's that to consider as well. Can you imagine Loris as one of the 99 as, or, or as the companion in a Daxos deck? I've seen that in standard. It ain't pretty. Keep hybrid in all colors, please. <sighs> Hello, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the question, persistently so, of Planeswalkers as commanders, I think that Brawl is a good place to start looking at them. But from my experience, it's not something that should be done. The rules for the format were designed with legendary creatures in mind, and something simple as commander damage gets tossed out the window when the only commanders who can reasonably do it are a couple of the Sarkons or Gideon. But what really concerns me about walkers as commanders, aside from the far wider card base, which means, you know, problems, is the scale of what they bring to the table reliably. For example, Kenrick, the good king, five abilities compared to most walkers, three. But walkers are inherently more protectable and less targetable than creatures, which means that they tend to do more for the same amount of effort. And let's not talk about Tiff Fury, the Time Master from Core 2021. Don't get me started on and yeah, let's also let, let's not talk about a Nickel Bolas Dragon God. Grix's control backed up by a planeswalker like him, who has the ability of saying, I win the game because nobody else is a legendary permanent. Oh, and by the way, I have all the abilities of all the other planeswalkers. Something that can keep coming back again and again and again? No. Planeswalkers as commanders, not a good idea, except for the ones that are specifically designed as commanders. Uh, and to be honest, do you really want... Hello, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition. Let's try that again. Hello, my name is John Barry. I'm the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. Uh, so with regards to the question of, I have just been appointed as the sole person in charge of the commander format. What rules would I add, subtract, change, and what would I ban or unban? Well, step one, panic. Because, oh God, I'd be horrible at this job. But since you asked, I have two things that I would like to do. And these are personal choices as a result of my own experience. The first... Change how poison works from being a flat 10 to a more global rule. That being, a player loses the game when they have poison counters equal to or greater than half their initial life total rounded up. This brings it in line with Two-Headed Giant and is open enough to address commander and the damage discrepancy between 40 starting life, 21 commander damage, or 10 poison damage. And it can be applied to things like Two-Headed Commander or Vanguard Commander if those ever become real formats. Second, and this is definitely me being very petty here, I would like to ban Triumph of the Hordes, because Infect is bad, and this card giving Infect to all creatures is worse. I've been on the receiving end of a table wipe thanks to this card, and it just sticks in my craw that such a thing was printed at uncommon, let alone printed at all. I mean, it's not like I can use my new godlike powers over the format at this point to simply point and command, ban new Phyrexia. That we, I do not and cannot alienate the spikes in the game. That is wrong, and it leads to bad games and bad game design. I cannot and must not act on my personal preferences if I was actually in charge. I'd still tie poison to the starting life total, and rather than an arbitrary number, makes in fact work a little bit harder for their win, and puts them in the same league as commander damage, or so I hope. Hello. My name is John Barry. I am the author of Pattern Recognition, hosted by tappedout.net, the online deck building community. With regards to the subject of, uh, Commander has become very popular, more popular than it's ever been. How do I feel about this current state of the format? Commander is in a good place. It's not devouring any other formats, like Modern Devoured Extended, and I was there for that, nor is it being strangled by other ways to play the game. 
I appreciate the Wizards is allowing and encouraging the format, going so far as to change how cards are worded to allow for more multiplayer formats. I like that we're getting cards specifically for us Commander players as a way to help ease new players into the format. Precons are a good idea. Please make more. But like much like my dad's barbecue, uh, too much of a good thing can hurt as well. It's okay to celebrate the year of Commander as 2020 is turning out to be, but this has to be tempered by the expectations that we, the players, have on the format, as well as what Wizards feels comfortable in putting out. Too much of a good thing. We don't want to inundate players with a flood of cards. Commander is not a format that is easy to dip into as others like Standard or Pioneer, and trying too hard can put people off of them. I work in retail. You don't push something. You promote it. And the line between the two is very narrow and fraught with peril. Treat the format with respect and be rewarded. Abuse it and watch it burn. So, for now, long live Commander! Thank you.